Chapter Six of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In a kibitka covered with bast, drawn by three lean and sleepy nags, Raisky drove slowly to his estate. It was not without agitation that he saw the smoke curling up from the chimneys of his own roof, the fresh, delicate green of the birches and the limes which overshadowed this place of refuge the gables of the old house and the pale line of the volga now gleaming between the trees and now hidden from view he approached nearer and nearer now he could see the shimmer of the flowers in the garden the avenues of lime and acacia became visible the old elm emerged and there more to the left lay the orchard there were dogs in the yard cats sunning themselves on the roof of the new house flocked the pigeon and the swallows flitted around the eaves behind the house on the side towards the village linen lay out to bleach one woman was roaring a cask the coachman was chopping wood a peasant got into the telega and gathered up the reins boris saw only unfamiliar faces but Yakov was there and looked sleepily round. One familiar face, but how aged! Raisky observed the scene intently. He alighted from the kibitka and walked along the fence which divided house, yard, garden, and park from the road, feasting his eyes on the well remembered prospect, when suddenly his eye was caught by an unexpected apparition on the veranda which led down to the garden and was decorated by lemon and pomegranate trees in tubs and with cactus and aloe and flowering plants stood a young girl of about twenty scattering millet from two plates held by a barefooted child of twelve at her feet were assembled hens turkeys ducks pigeons sparrows and daws she called to the birds to come to breakfast and cocks hens and pigeons fell to looking round every moment as if they feared treason and then again falling to as the morning sun shed a fierce light on the busy group of birds and on the young girl herself raisky saw her large dark gray eyes her round healthy cheeks her narrow white teeth her long light brown tresses wound twice round her head and the strong young breasts rising and sinking underneath her white blouse her white slightly tanned neck was innocent of collar or scarf a hasty movement loosened one plate of hair over her head and back but she took no notice but continued to scatter the corn taking care that all received their share and that sparrows and doors did not obtrude too much and looking as fresh and happy as the morning itself didn't you see the goose she asked the little girl in a loud clear voice no answered the child it is the cat's fault afimia says it will die i shall look after it myself afimia has no pity motionless raisky watched the scene without his presence being suspected this must be his cousin and how charming but which one verochka or marfinka without waiting for the kibitka to turn in through the gate he ran forward and stood before the young girl cousin he cried extending his arms in a moment both girls had vanished as if by magic the sparrows were away on the roof and the pigeons in flight the servants in the yard stopped their work raisky looked in amazement on the emptiness and at the corn scattered at his feet then he heard in the house bustle murmurs movement the clatter of keys and his aunt's voice where is he her face lighted up when she saw raisky and she opened her arms to press him to her breast she had aged, but in so even, so healthy a fashion 
that there were no unwholesome patches no deep hanging pockets about the eyes and mouth no sadness or gloom in her eyes life had not conquered her she conquered life and only slowly laid down her weapons in the combat her voice was not so clear as of old and she leaned on a stick but she made no complaint she still wore no cap on her short hair health and kindliness shone from her eyes and not only from her eyes from her whole figure vorushka my friend three times she embraced him tears stood in her eyes in her embrace her voice in the sudden grip of joy there was tenderness affection and ardour he felt that he was almost a criminal that he had been playing with his emotions and seeking forbidden fruit wandering homelessly in the world while nature himself had been preparing for him a nest where sympathy and happiness awaited him marfinka where are you come here cried her grandmother she was so terrified when she saw you and terrified me too let me look at you borushka she led him to the light and looked at him long and earnestly how ill you look she said but no you are sunburnt the moustache suits you why do you grow a beard shave it off borushka i can't endure it ah gray hairs here and there already you are beginning to age too soon it's not with age granny why then are you in good health i am well enough let us talk of something else you thank god are always the same what do you mean you don't alter a bit are still as beautiful as ever i never saw an old lady whose age adorned her so thanks for the compliment my child it would be better for you to spend your admiration on your sisters i will whisper the truth to you two such beauties you will not find in the town especially the other where is my other sister on a visit to the pope's wife on the other side of the volga it is a pity the pope's wife has been ill and sent for her of course just now a messenger shall go no no why should any one be disturbed on my account and you have come on your grandmother so suddenly we waited waited in vain the peasant sat up for you at night i have just sent yegorka on to the highway to look for you and Savelli into the town now you must have your breakfast why is it so long in coming the master has come and there is nothing ready just as if the house was nothing better than a station serve what is ready i need nothing granny i am stuffed with food at one station i drank tea milk at another and at the third there was a wedding and i was treated to wine meat and gingerbread you are on your way home to your grandmother and are not ashamed to eat and drink all sorts of things gingerbread in the morning marfinka ought to have been there she loves weddings and gingerbread come in marfinka don't be so shy she is ashamed because you caught her in her morning gown come here darling he is your brother tea and coffee appeared and finally breakfast however much he protested raisky had to eat for otherwise his aunt's morning would have been spoiled marfinka come here and entertain us after about five minutes the door opened slowly and quietly and marfinka entered blushing with confusion and with downcast eyes at her heels followed vasilisa with a tea-tray full of sweets preserves cakes etc marfinka stood still betraying in her confusion a certain curiosity she wore lace at her neck and wrists 
her hair was plaited firmly around her head and the waist of her barrage dress encircled by a blue ribbon raisky threw down his napkin and jumped up to stand before her in admiration how lovely he cried this is my little sister marfa vasilyevna and is the goose still alive marfinka became still more embarrassed returned his greeting awkwardly and retired to a corner you have both gone mad interrupted their aunt is that the way to greet one another marfa vasilyevna said raisky as he sought to kiss marfinka's hand vasilyevna cried tatiana markovna don't you love her any more marfinka not marfa vasilyevna you will be addressing me as tatiana markovna next kiss one another are you not brother and sister i won't grandma he is teasing me about the goose it is not polite to spy on people she said severely everybody laughed raisky kissed her on both cheeks embraced her and overcame her confusion she kissed him in return and her shyness vanished do you remember marfinka how we used to run about and draw and how you cried no but yes i do remember as if in a dream how should she remember when she was only five interrupted her aunt but i do grandmamma as in a dream raisky had hardly captured his old memories when marfinka disappeared soon she returned with sketchbooks drawings and toys and sitting down by raisky in friendly fashion began granny says that i don't remember i remember how you used to draw and how i sat on your knee granny has all your drawings portraits and sketchbooks she has kept them all in the dark room where the silver the diamonds and the lace are she got them out and gave them to me a little time ago when she heard you were coming here is my portrait how funny i looked and here is verochka and granny and vasilisa do you remember how you held me and verochka sat on your shoulder and you carried us over the water do you remember that too asked her aunt boastful child verochka said the other day this is how i draw now said marfinka handing him a drawing of a bunch of flowers splendid little sister is it done from nature yes from nature i can make wax flowers too and do you play or sing i play the piano and does verochka draw and play marfinka shook her head does she like needlework no then is she fond of reading yes she reads a great deal but she does not tell us what she reads nor show us the book nor even say where she got it she hides herself from everybody does my strange child sighed tatiana markovna god only knows what will become of her now marfinka don't waste your brother's time any longer with your chatter about trifles we will talk about serious matters about the estate the old lady had worn a serious expression while she watched boris as he talked to marfinka she recognized his mother's features but the changes in his face did not escape her the indications of vanishing youth the premature furrows and she was baffled by the original expression of his eyes formerly she had always been able to read his face but now there was much inscribed on it that was undecipherable for her yet his temperament was open and affectionate and his words frankly interpreted his thoughts now his aunt stood before him wearing a most business-like expression in her hand were accounts and a ledger are you not weary with your journey she said you are yawning and perhaps you would like a little sleep business can wait till to-morrow i slept a good deal on the journey but you are giving yourself useless trouble grandmother for i am not going to look at your accounts what you have surely come to take over the estate and to ask for an account of my stewardship the accounts and statements that i sent you i have never even read grandmother you haven't read them 
i have sent you precise information about your income and you don't even know how your money is spent and i don't want to know answered raisky looking out of the window away towards the banks of the volga imagine marfinka he said i remember a verse i learned to the child o volga proudest of rivers stem thy hurrying flood o volga hearken hearken to the ringing song of the poet the unknown whose life thou hast spared don't be vexed with me borushka cried tatiana markovna but i think you are mad what have you done with the papers i sent you have you brought them where are they she continued as he shook his head granny i tore up all the accounts and i swear i will do the same with these if you worry me with them he seized the paper but she snatched them away exclaiming you dare to tear up my accounts he laughed suddenly embraced her and kissed her lips as he'd done when he was a child she shook herself free and wiped her mouth i toil till midnight adding up and writing down every copic and he tears up my work that is why you never wrote about money matters gave any orders made any preparations or did anything of the kind did you never think of your estate not at all granny i forgot all about it if i thought at all i thought of these rooms in which lives the only woman who loves me and is loved by me you alone in the whole world and now he said turning to marfinka i want to win my sisters too his aunt took off her spectacles and gazed at him in all my days i have never seen anything like it she said here the only person with no roots like that is markushka what sort of person is this markushka leonti kozlov writes about him how is leonti granny i must look him up how should he be he crouches in one spot with a book and his wife in another but he does not even see what goes on under his nose and can any good come from his friendship with this markushka only the other day your friend came here to complain that that markushka was destroying books from your library you know don't you that the library from the old house has been installed in kozlov's house raisky hummed an air from il barbier you are an extraordinary man cried his aunt angrily why did you come at all do talk sensibly i came to see you granny to live here for a little while to breathe freely to look out over the volga to write to draw but the estate if you are not tired we will drive out into the field to look at the sowing of the winter corn later on granny will you take over the management of the estate no granny i will not who then to look after it i am old and can no longer do all the work do you wish me to put the estate into strange hands farm it yourself granny so long as you take any pleasure in it and if i die then leave everything as it is tatiana markovna looked at the portrait of raisky's mother for a long time she looked at the languishing eyes the melancholy smile yes she whispered i honour the memory of the departed but here is the fault she kept you by her side talked to you played the piano read out of books and wept as she did so and this is the result singing and painting now tell me borushka she went on in her ordinary tone what is to become of the house of the linen the silver the diamonds shall you order them to be given to the peasants do i possess diamonds and silver how often have i told you so from your mother you have inherited all these things what is to be done with them 
i will show you the inventory of them don't do that for heaven's sake i can believe they are mine and so i can dispose of them as i please of course you are the proprietor we live here as your guests though we do not eat your bread see here are my receipts and expenditure she said thrusting towards another big ledger which he waved away but i believe all you say granny he said send for a clerk and tell him to make out a deed by which i give the house the land and all that belongs to it to my dear cousins verochka and marfinka as dowry the old lady wrinkled her brow and waited impatiently till he should finish speaking so long as you live dear granny he continued the estate naturally remains under your control the peasants must have their freedom never interrupted his aunt verochka and marfinka are not beggars each of them has her fifty thousand roubles and after my death three times that sum perhaps more all i have is for my little girls and thank god i am not a pauper i have a corner of my own a bit of land and a roof to cover them one would think you were a millionaire you make gifts you will have this and you won't have that here marfinka where have you hidden yourself directly cried marfinka's clear voice from a neighboring room happy gay smiling and frank she fluttered into the room looked hesitatingly first at raisky then at her aunt who was nearly beside herself your cousin marfinka is pleased to present you with a house silver and lace you are he thinks a beggared dowless girl make a curtsy thank your benefactor kiss his hand well marfinka who did not know what to say squeezed herself flat against the stove and looked at her two relatives her aunt pushed papers and books on one side crossed her hands over her breast and looked out of the window while raisky sat down beside marfinka and took her hand would you like to go away from here marfinka into a strange house perhaps in an altogether different district god forbid how could such a thing happen whoever imagined such nonsense granny laughed raisky happily granny had not heard the words marfinka was embarrassed and looked out of the window here i have everything i want the lovely flowers in the garden the birds who would look after the birds i will never go away from here never but granny wants to go and take you with her granny where why she asked her aunt in her caressing coaxing way don't tease me said tatiana markovna marfinka you don't want to leave home asked boris not for anything in the world how could such a thing be what would verochka say about it she would never be separated from the old house she loves the old house yes she is only happy when she is here if she were taken away from it she would die we both should that matter is settled then little sister you too verochka and you will accept the gift from me won't you i will if verochka agrees agreed dear sister you are not so proud as granny he said as he kissed her forehead what is agreed suddenly grumbled tatiana markovna you have accepted who told you you might accept grandmother will never permit you to live at a stranger's expense be so kind boris pavlovitch as to take over books accounts inventories and sales i am not your paid servant she pushed papers and books towards him granny granny my name is tatiana markovna berezhkov she stood up and opened the door into the servant's room send savelli here a quarter of an hour later a peasant of almost forty-five years of age opened the door with a casual greeting he was strongly built big-boned and was robust without being fat his eyes with their overhanging brows and wide heavy lids wasted no idle glances 
he neither spoke an unnecessary word nor made a superfluous gesture the proprietor is here said tatiana markovna indicating raisky you must now make your reports to him he intends to administer the estate himself savelli looked askance at raisky at your orders he said stiffly slowly raising his eyes what orders are you pleased to give he asked lowering his eyes again raisky thought for a moment before he replied do you know an official who could draw up a document for the transfer of the estate uh, gavril ivanov meshechnikov draws up the papers we require he said send for him as savelli bowed and slowly retired raisky followed him with his eyes an anxious rascal was his comment how should he be other than anxious said his aunt when he is tied to a wife like marina antipovna do you remember antip well she is his daughter but for his marriage he is a treasure he does my important business sells the corn and collects the money he is honest and practical but fate deals her blows where she will and every man must bear his own burden but what idea have you in your head now are you beside yourself something must be done i am going away and you will not administer the estate so some arrangement must be made and is that your reason for going i thought you were now going to take over the management of your estate you have done enough gadding about why not marry and settle here she was visibly struggling with herself it had never entered her head to give up the administration she would not have known what to do with herself her idea had been to alarm raisky and he was taking her seriously what is to be done she said i will see after the estate as long as i have the strength to do so how else should you live you strange creature i received two thousand roubles from my other estate and that is a sufficient income i want to work to draw to write to travel for a little and for that purpose i might mortgage or sell the other estate god bless you borushka what next are you so near beggary you talk of drawing writing alienating your land next it will be giving lessons or school teaching instead of arriving with four horses and the travelling carriage you sneak in without a servant in a miserable kibitka you a raisky look at the old house at the portraits of your ancestors and take shame to yourself shame borushka how splendid it would have been if you had come a poletted like sergey ivanovitch and had married a wife with a dowry of three thousand souls raisky burst out laughing why laugh i am speaking seriously when i tell you what a joy it would have been for your grandmother then you would have wanted the lace and the silver and not be flinging it away but as i am not marrying i don't need these things therefore it is settled that verochka and marfinka shall have them your decision is final it is final and it is further settled that if you do not like this arrangement everything passes into the hands of strangers you have my word for it your word for it cried his aunt you are a lost man where have you lived and what have you done tell me for heaven's sake what your purpose in life is and what you really are what i am grandmother the unhappiest of men he leaned his head back on the cushion as he spoke never say such a thing she interrupted fate hears and exacts the penalty and you will one day be unhappy either be content or feign content she looked anxiously around as if fate were already standing at her shoulder raisky rose from the divan let us be reconciled he said agree to keep this little corner of god's earth under your protection it is an estate not a corner 
resign yourself to my gift of this old stuff to the dear girls a lonely man like me has no use for it but they will be mistresses of a house if you don't agree i will present it to the school the school children those rascals who steal our apples shall not have it come to the point granny you don't really want to leave this nest in your old age we'll see we'll see give them the lace on their wedding day i can do nothing with you talk to t nikonich who is coming to dinner and she wondered what would come of such strangeness raisky took his cap to go out and marfinger went with him she showed him the park her own garden the vegetable and flower gardens and the arbors when they came to the precipice she looked anxiously over the edge and drew back with a shudder raisky looked down on the volga which was in flood and had overflowed into the meadows in the distance were ships which appeared to be motionless and above hung heaped banks of cloud marfinka drew closer to raisky and looked down indifferently on the familiar picture come down he said suddenly and seized her hand no i'm afraid she answered trembling and drew back i won't let you fall do you think i can't take care of you not at all but i am afraid verochka has no fear but goes down alone even in the dusk although a murderer lies buried here she is not afraid try shut your eyes and give me your hand you will see how carefully i take you down marfinka half closed her eyes but she had hardly taken his hand and made one step when she found herself standing on the edge of the precipice shuddering she withdrew her hand i would not go down for anything in the world she cried as she ran back where are you going to no answer reached her she approached the edge and looked timidly over she saw how the bushes were bent noisily aside as raisky sprang down step by step how horrible she thought as she returned to the house end of chapter six chapter seven of the precipice by ivan gonchirov translated by m bryant this librivox recording is in the public domain raisky went nearly all round the town and when he climbed the cliffs once more he was on the extreme boundary of his estate a steep path led down to the suburbs and the town lay before him as in the palm of a hand stirred with the passion aroused by his memories of childhood he looked at the rows of houses cottages and huts it was not a town but like other towns a cemetery going from street to street raisky saw through the windows how in one house the family sat at dinner and in another the samovar had already been brought in in the empty streets every conversation could be heard a verst away voices and footsteps re-echoed on the wooden pavement it seemed to raisky a picture of dreamy peace the tranquillity of the grave what a frame for a novel if only he knew what to put in the novel the houses fell into their places in the picture that filled his mind he drew in the faces of the townspeople grouped the servants with his aunt the whole composition centering in marfinka the figures stood sharply outlined in his mind they lived and breathed if the image of passion should float over this motionless sleeping little world the picture would glow with the enchanting color of life where was he to find the passion the color passion he repeated to himself if her burning fire could but be poured out upon him and engulfed the artist in her destroying waves as he moved forward he remembered that his stroll had an aim he wondered how leonid kozlov was whether he had changed or whether he had remained what he had been before a child for all his learning he too was a good subject for an artist raisky thought of leontie's beautiful wife 
whose acquaintance he had made during his student days in moscow when she was a young girl she used to call leonti his fiance without any denial on his part and five years after he had left the university he made the journey to moscow and married her he loved his wife as a man loves air and warmth absorbed in the life and art of the ancients his lover's eyes saw in her the antique ideal of beauty the lines of her neck and bosom charmed him and her head recalled to him roman heads seen on bas reliefs and cameos leonti did not recognize raisky when his friend suddenly entered his study i have not the honor he began but when boris pavlovich opened his lips he embraced him wife yulinka he cried into the garden come quickly and see who has come to see us she came hastily and kissed raisky what a man you have grown and how much more handsome you are she said her eyes flashing her eyes her mien her whole figure betrayed audacity just over thirty years old she gave the impression of a splendidly developed specimen of blooming womanhood have you forgotten me she asked how should he forget you broke in leonti but yulinka is right you have altered and are hardly recognizable with your beard how delighted your aunt must have been to see you ah his aunt remarked yulian andreevna in a tone of displeasure i don't like her why not she is despotic and censorous yes she is a despot answered raisky that comes from intercourse with serfs old customs according to tatiana markovna continued yulian andreevna everybody should stay on one spot turn his head neither to right nor left and never exchange a word with his neighbours she is a past mistress in fault-finding nevertheless she and tit nikonitch are inseparable he spends his days and nights with her raisky laughed and said he is a saint nevertheless whatever you may find to say about her a saint perhaps but nothing is right for her her world is in her two nieces and who knows how they will turn out marfinka plays with her canaries and her flowers and the other sits in the corner like the family ghost and not a word can be got from her we shall see what will become of her verochka i haven't seen her yet she is away on a visit on the other side of the volga and who knows what her business is there i love my aunt as if she were my mother said raisky emphatically she is wise honourable just she has strength and individuality and there is nothing commonplace about her you will believe everything she says asked yuliana andreevna drawing him away to the window while leonti collected the scattered papers laid them in cupboards and put the books on the shelves yes everything he said don't believe her i know she will tell you all sorts of nonsense about monsieur charles who is he a frenchman a teacher and a colleague of my husband's they sit there reading till all hours how can i help it yet god knows what they make out of it in the town as if i don't believe it she went on as she saw raisky was silent it is idle talk there is nothing she concluded with a false smile intended to be allowing what business is it of mine returned raisky turning away from her shall we go into the garden yes we will have dinner outside said leonti serve what there is yulinka come boris now we can talk then as an idea struck him he added what shall you have to say to me about the library about what library you wrote to me about it but i did not understand what you were talking about i think you said some person called mark had been tearing the books you cannot imagine boris how vexed i was about it he said as he took down some books with torn backs from the shelves raisky pushed the books away what does it matter to me he said 
you are like my grandmother she bothers me about accounts you about books but boris i don't know what accounts she bothered you about but these books are your most precious possession look he said pointing with pride to the rows of books which filled the study to the ceiling only on this shelf nearly everything is ruined by that accursed mark the other books are all right see i drew up a catalogue which took a whole year to do and he pointed self-consciously to a thick bound volume of manuscript i wrote it all with my own hand he continued sit down boris and read out the names i will get on the ladder and show you the books they are arranged according to their numbers huh, what an idea or better wait till after dinner we shall not be able to finish before listen should you like to have a library like that asked raisky i a library like that sunshine blazed from leontes eyes he smiled so broadly that even the hair on his brow stirred with the dislocation caused a library like that he shook his head you must be mad tell me do you love me as you used to why do you ask of course then the books shall be yours for good and all under one condition i take these books leonti looked now at the books now at raisky then made a gesture of refusal and sighed do not laugh at me boris don't tempt me i am not joking here yuliana andreevna who had heard the last words chimed in with take what is given you she is always like that sighed leonti on feast days the tradesmen come with presents and on the eve of the examinations the parents i send them away but my wife receives them at the side door she looks like lucretia but she has a sweet tooth a dainty one raisky laughed but yuliana andreevna was annoyed go to your lucretia she said indifferently he compares me with everybody one day i am cleopatra then lavinia then cornelia better take the books when they are offered you boris pavlovich will give them to me don't take it on yourself to ask him for gifts commanded leonti and what can we give him shall i hand you over to him for instance he added as he embraced her splendid take me boris pavlovich she cried throwing a sparking glance at him if you don't take the books leonti said raisky i will make them over to the gymnasium give me the catalogue and i'll send it to the director to-morrow he put his hand out for the catalogue of which leonti kept a tight hold the gymnasium shall never get one of them he cried you don't know the director who cares for books just about as much as i do for perfume and pomade they will be destroyed torn and worse handled than by mark then take them to give away such treasure all in a minute it would be incomprehensible if you were selling them to responsible hands i have never wanted so much to be rich i would give five thousand i cannot accept i cannot if you are a spendthrift or rather a blind ignorant child many thanks i didn't mean that cried leonti in confusion if you are an artist you need pictures statues music and books are nothing to you besides you don't know what treasures you possess after dinner i will show you well in the afternoon instead of drinking coffee you will go over with the books to the gymnasium for me wait boris what was the condition on which you would give me the books will you take installments from my salary for them i would sell all i have pledge myself and my wife no thank you broke in yuliana andreevna i can pledge or sell myself if i want to leonti and raisky looked at one another she does not think before she speaks said leonti but tell me what the condition is that you never mention these books to me again even if mark tears them to pieces do you mean i am not to let him have access to them he is not likely to ask you put in yuliana andreevna as if that monster cared for what you may say 
how yulinka loves me said leonti to Raisky. would that every woman loved her husband like that he embraced her she dropped her eyes and the smile died from her face but for her you would not see a single button on my clothes continued leonti i eat and sleep comfortably and our household goes on evenly and placidly however small my means are she knows how to make them provide for everything she raised her eyes and looked at them for the last statement was true it's a pity continued leonti that she does not care about books she can chatter french fast enough but if you give her a book she does not understand half of it she still writes russian incorrectly if she sees greek characters she says they would make a good pattern for cotton printing and sets the book upside down and she cannot even read a latin title that will do not another word about the books only on that condition i don't send them to the gymnasium now let us sit down to table or i shall go to my grandmother's for i am famished do you intend to spend your whole life like this asked raisky as he was sitting after dinner alone with leonti in the study yes what more do i need have you no desires does nothing call you away from this place have you no longings for freedom and space and don't you feel cramped in this narrow frame of hedge church spire and house under your very nose have i so little to look at under my nose asked leonti pointing to the books i have books pupils and in addition a wife and peace of heart isn't that enough are books life this old trash has a great deal to answer for men strive forwards seek to improve themselves to cleanse their conceptions to drive away the mist to meet the problems of society by justice civilization orderly administration while you instead of looking at life study books what is not to be found in books is not to be found in life either or if there is anything it is of no importance said leonti firmly the whole program of public and private life lies behind us we can find an example for everything you are still the same old student leonti always worrying about what has been experienced in the past and never thinking of what you yourself are what i am i am a teacher of the classics i am deeply concerned with the life of the past as you with ideals and figures you are an artist why should you wonder that certain figures are dear to me since when have artists ceased to draw water from the wells of the ancients yes an artist said raisky with a sigh he pointed to his head and breast here are figures notes forms enthusiasm the creative passion and as yet i have done almost nothing what restrains you you are now painting you wrote me a great picture which you mean to exhibit the devil take the great pictures i shall hardly be able to devote my whole energy to painting now one must put one's whole being into a great picture and then to give effect to one hundredth part of what one has put in a representation of a fleeting irrecoverable impression sometimes i paint portraits what art are you following now there is but one art that can satisfy the artist of to-day the art of words of poetry which is limitless in its possibilities you write verses then verses are children's food in verse you celebrate a love affair a festival flowers a nightingale and satire remember the use made of it by the romans with these words he would have gone to the bookshelf but raisky held him back you may he said be able now and then to hit a diseased spot with satire satire is a rod whose stroke stings but has no further consequences 
but she does not show your figures brimming with life she does not reveal the depths of life with its secret mainsprings of action she holds no mirror before your eyes it is only the novel that comprehends and mirrors the life of man so you are writing a novel on what subject i have not yet quite decided don't at all events describe this pitifogging miserable existence which stares us in the face without the medium of art our contemporary literature squeezes every worm every peasant girl and i don't know what else into the novel choose a historical subject worthy of your vivacious imagination and your clean-cut style do you remember how you used to write of old russia now it is the fashion to choose material from the end heap the talking shop of everyday life this is to be the stuff of which literature is made bah it is the merest journalism there we are again on the old controversy if you once mount that horse there will be no calling you back let us leave this question for the moment and go back to my question are you satisfied to spend your life here as you are now doing with no desires for anything further leontie looked at him in astonishment with wide-opened eyes you do nothing for your generation raisky went on but creep backwards like a crab why are you forever talking of the greeks and romans their work is done and ours is to bring life into these cemeteries to shake the slumbering ghosts out of their twilight dreams and how is the task to be begun i mean to draw a picture of this existence to reflect it as in a mirror and you i to accomplish something i have prepared several boys for the university remarked leontie with hesitation for he was not sure whether this was meritorious or not you imagine that i go into my class then home and forget about everything that is not the case young people gather around me attach themselves to me and i show them drawings of old buildings utensils make sketches and give explanations as i once did for you what i know myself i communicate to others explain the ancient ideals of virtue expound classical life just as our own classics are explained is that no longer essential certainly it has its advantage but it has nothing to do with real life one cannot live like that today so much had disappeared so many things have arisen that the greeks and romans never knew but we need models from contemporary life we must educate ourselves and others to be men that is our task no i do not take that upon my shoulders it is sufficient for one to take the models of ancient virtue from books i myself live for and through myself you see i live quietly and modestly eat my vermicelli soup life for and through yourself is not life at all it is a passive condition and man is a fighting animal i have already told you that i do my duty and do not interfere in anybody else's business and no one interferes with mine life's arm is long and will not spare even you and how will you meet her blows unprepared what has life to do with a humble man like me i shall pass unnoticed i have books although they are not mine he said glancing hesitatingly at raisky but you give me free use of them my needs are small i feel no boredom i have a wife who loves me raisky looked away and he added in a whisper i love her it was plain that as his mind nourished itself on the books so his heart had found a warm refuge he himself did not even know what bound him to life and books and did not guess that he might keep his books and lose his life and that his life would be maimed if his roman head was stolen from him happy child thought raisky in his learned sleep he does not notice the darkness that is hidden in that dear roman head 
nor how empty the woman's heart is. He is helpless as far as she is concerned, and will never convince her of the virtues of the ancient ideals. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov Translated by M. Bryant This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The sun was setting when Raisky returned home and was received at the door by Marfinka. Where did you get lost, cousin? she asked him. Grandmother is very angry and is grumbling. I was with Leonti, returned Raisky indifferently. I thought so, and told grandmother so, but she won't listen and will hardly speak even to tit nikonitch he is with her now and polina karpovna too go to grandmother and it will be all right are you afraid does your heart beat fast raisky had to laugh she is very angry we had prepared so many dishes we will eat them up for supper will you grandmother grandmother she cried happily cousin has come and wants his supper his aunt sat severely there and did not look up when Raisky entered. Tit Nikonich embraced him. He received an elegant bow from Polina Karpovna, an elaborately got up person of forty five in a low cut muslin gown, with a fine lace handkerchief and a fan which she kept constantly in motion, although there was no heat. What a man you have grown! I should hardly have known you said tit nikonitch beaming with kindness and pleasure he has grown very very handsome said polina karpovna kritsky you have not altered tit nikonitch remarked raisky you have hardly aged at all and are as gay as fresh as kind and amiable thank god there is nothing worse than rheumatism the matter with me and my digestion is no longer quite as good as it was that is age age but how glad i am that you our guest have arrived in such good spirits tatiana markovna was anxious about you you will be staying here for some time of course you will spend the summer with us said polina karpovna here is nature and fine air and so many people are interested in you he looked at her askance and said nothing do you remember me she asked boris's aunt noticed with displeasure that polina karpovna was ogling her nephew no i must confess i forgot yes impressions are quickly forgotten in the capital she said in a languishing tone she looked him up and down and then added what an admirable travelling suit oh that reminds me i am still in my travelling clothes yegor must be sent for and must take my clothes and linen out of the trunk for you granny and for you my dear sisters i have brought some small things for remembrance marfinka grew crimson with pleasure uh, granny where are you going to put me up the house belongs to you where you will she returned coldly don't be angry granny he laughed it won't happen twice you may laugh you may laugh boris pavlovitch here in the presence of our guests i tell you you have behaved badly you have hardly put your nose inside the house and straight away vanish that is an insult to your grandmother surely granny we shall be together every day i have been visiting an old friend and we forgot ourselves in talking cousin boris did not do it on purpose granny said marfinka leonti ivanovitch is so good please be silent when you are not addressed you are too young to contradict your grandmother who knows what she is saying smilingly marfinka drew back into her corner no doubt yuliana andreevna was able to entertain you better and knows better than i how to entertain a petersburger what fricassee did she give you asked his aunt not without a little real curiosity vermicelli soup pastry with cabbage then beef and potatoes tatiana markovna laughed ironically vermicelli soup and beef and groats in the pan 
it's a long time since you tasted such delicacies excellent dishes said tit nikonich kindly but heavy for the digestion to-morrow marfinka said the old lady we will entertain our guest with a gosling pickled pork carrots and perhaps with a goose a goose stuffed with groats would be acceptable put in raisky indigestible protested tit nikonich the best is a light soup with pearl barley a cutlet pastries and jelly that is the proper midday meal but i should like groats do you like mushrooms too cousin asked marfinka because we have so many rather can't we have them for supper to-night in spite of tit nikonich's caution against this heavy food tatiana markovna sent marfinka to peter and to the cook to order mushrooms for supper if there is any champagne in the cellar granny let us have a bottle up tit nikonich and i would like to drink your health isn't that so tit nikonich yes to celebrate your arrival though mushrooms and champagne are indigestible tell the cook to bring champagne on ice marfinka said the old lady said tit nikonich amiably with a slight bow supper is a special occasion but one ought to dine at home too you have vexed your grandmother by going out on the very day of your return ah tatiana markovna sighed polina karpovna our ways here are so bourgeois but in the capital the old lady's eyes blazed as she pointed to the wall where hung the portraits of raisky's and the young girl's parents and exclaimed there was nothing bourgeois about those polina karpovna granny said raisky let us allow one another absolute freedom i'm now making up for my absence at midday and shall be here all night but i can't tell where i shall dine to-morrow or where i shall sleep polina karpovna could not refrain from applauding but his aunt looked at him with amazement and inquired if he were really a gypsy monsieur raisky is a poet and poets are as free as air remarked polina karpovna again she made play with her eyes shifted the pointed toes of her shoes in an effort to arouse raisky's attention the more she twisted and turned the more icy was his indifference for her presence made an uncomfortable impression on him marfinka observed the by-play and smiled to herself you have two houses land peasants silver and glass and talk of wandering about from one shelter to another like a beggar like markushka the vagrant markushka again i must certainly make his acquaintance no don't do that and add to your grandmother's anxieties if you see him make your escape but why he will lead you astray that's of no consequence grandmother it looks as if he were an interesting individual doesn't it tit nikonich he is a riddle to everybody tit nikonich answered with a smile he must have gone astray very early in life but he has apparently good brains and considerable knowledge and might have been a useful member of society Polina Karpovna turned her head away and dismissed Mark with a criticism. No manners. Brains. You bought his brains for three hundred roubles. Has he repaid them? asked Tatiana Markovna. I did not remind him of his debt, but to me he is, for the matter of that, almost polite. That is to say, he does not strike you or shoot in your direction. Just imagine, Boris that he nearly shot neil andreevich his dogs tore my train complained polina karpovna did he ever visit you unceremoniously at dinner again tatiana markovna asked tit nikonich no you don't like me to receive him so i refuse his admission he once came to me at night he went on addressing raisky he had been out hunting and had eaten nothing for twenty-four hours i gave him food and we passed the time very pleasantly pleasantly exclaimed tatiana markovna 
how can you say such things if he came to me at that hour i would settle him no boris pavlovitch live like other decent people stay with us have dinner with us go out with us keep suspicious people at a distance see how i administer your estate and find fault if i do anything wrong that is so monotonous grandmother let us rather leave each one after his own ideas and inclinations you are an exception sighed his aunt no grandmother it is you who are an exceptional woman why should we bother about one another to please your grandmother why don't you want to please your grandson you are a despot grandmother a despot boris pavlovitch i have waited anxiously for you i have hardly slept have tried to have everything as you liked it but you did all that because activity is a pleasure to you all this care and trouble is a pleasant stimulant keeps you busy if markushka came to you you would receive him in the same fashion you are right cousin broke in marfinka grandmother is kindness itself but she tries to disguise it don't give your opinion when it is not asked she contradicts her grandmother only when you are here boris pavlovitch at other times she is modest enough and now the ideas she suddenly takes into her head i entertain markushka you did as you pleased continued raisky and then when it entered my head too to do as i pleased i disturbed your arrangements and made a breach in your despotism isn't that so granny and now kiss me and we will give one another full liberty what a strange boy do you hear tit nikonitch what nonsense he talks on that evening tatiana markovna and raisky concluded if not peace at least a truce she was assured that boris loved and esteemed her she was in truth easily convinced after supper raisky unpacked his trunk and brought down his gifts for his aunt a few pounds of excellent tea of which she was a connoisseur a coffee machine of a new kind with a coffee pot and a dark brown silk dress bracelets with monograms for his cousins and for tiet nikonitch vest and hose of samian leather as his aunt had desired tatiana markovna with tears in her eyes sat down beside him and putting her hand on his shoulder said and you remembered me whom else should i remember you are my nearest and dearest grandmother when tiet nikonitch and polina karpovna took leave the lady said that she had left orders with no one to fetch her and that she hoped someone would accompany her looking towards raisky as she spoke tit nikonitch expressed himself ready to see her home yegorka could have taken her whispered tatiana markovna why didn't she stay at home she was not invited thank you thank you said polina karpovna to raisky as she passed him what for asked raisky in amazement for the pleasant witty conversation although it was not directed to me what pleasure it gave me a practical conversation about groats a goose and a quarrel with grandmother ah i understand she continued but i caught two glances which were intended for me confess they were i am filled with hope and expectation as she went out raisky asked marfinka what she was talking about she is always like that laughed marfinka tatiana markovna followed raisky to his room smoothed the sheets of his bed once more drew the curtains so that the sun should not awaken him in the morning felt the feather bed to test its softness and had a jug of water placed on the table beside him she came back three times to see if he were asleep or wanted anything touched by so much kindly thought he recognized that his grandmother's activity was not only exerted to gratify herself end of chapter eight chapter nine of the precipice by ivan goncharov translated by m bryant 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The days passed quietly by. Every morning the sun climbed up through the blue air and lighted up the Volga and its banks. At midday the snowy clouds crept up, often piled one on another until the blue sky was hidden and the cooling rain fell on woods and fields. Then once more the clouds stole away before the approach of the warm, pleasant evening. Life at Malinovka passed just as peacefully. The naivete of the surroundings had not yet lost its charm for Raisky. The sunshine insinuating itself everywhere, his aunt's kind face, Marfinka's friendliness, and the willing attention of the servants, made up a pleasant, friendly environment. He even felt pleasure in the watchful guardianship that his aunt exercised over him. He smiled when she preached order to him, warned him of crime and temptation, reproached him for his gypsy tendencies, and tried to lead him to a definite plan of life. He liked Tit Nikonich, and saw in his courtesy and his extreme good manners, his care for his health, and the universal esteem and affection in which he was held, a survival from the last century. When he felt very good-tempered, he found even Polina Karpovna's eccentricities amusing. She had induced him to lunch with her one day, when she assured him that she was not indifferent to him, and that he himself was on the eve of returning her sentiments. The even, monotonous life lulled him like a cradle song. He wrote idly at his novel, strengthened the situation here, grouped a scene there, or accentuated a character. He watched his aunt, Leonti, and his wife, and Marfinka, all looked at the villages and fields, lying in an enchanted sleep along the banks of the Volga. In this ocean of silence he caught notes which he could interpret in terms of music, and determined, in his abundant leisure, to pursue the subject. One day, after a lonely walk along the shore, he climbed the cliff and passed Kozlov's house. Seeing that the windows were lighted, he was going up to the door when suddenly he heard someone climb over the fence and jump down into the garden. Standing in the shadow of the fence, Raisky hesitated. He was afraid to sound the alarm until he knew whether it was a thief or an admirer of Yuliana Andreevna's, some Monsieur Charles or other. However, he decided to pursue the intruder and promptly climbed the fence and followed him. The man stopped before a window and hammered on the pane. That is no thief, possibly Mark, thought Raisky. He was right. Philosopher, open, quick, cried the intruder. Go round to the entrance, said Leontie's voice dully through the glass. To the entrance to wake the dog? Open! Wait, said Leontie, and as he opened the window, Mark swung himself into the room. Who is that behind you? Whom have you brought with you? asked Leontie in terror. No one? Do you imagine there's a ghost? Ah, there is someone scrambling up. Boris? You? How did you happen to arrive together? he exclaimed as Raisky sprang into the room. Mark cast a hasty glance on Boris and turned to Leonti. Give me another pair of trousers. Have you any wine in the house? What is the matter and where have you been? asked Leonti suddenly, who had just noticed that Mark was covered up to the waist with wet and slime. Give me another pair of trousers quick, said Mark impatiently. What is the good of chattering? I have no wine, because we drank it all at dinner, when Monsieur Charles was our guest. Where do you keep your clothes? My wife is asleep, and I don't know. You must ask of Dotia. Fool! I will find them myself. He took a light and went into the next room. You see what he is like, sighed Leonti, addressing Raisky. After about ten minutes, Mark returned with the trousers, and Leonti questioned him as to how he had got wet through. I was crossing the Volga in a fishing boat. 
the ass of a fisherman fell asleep and brought us right up to the reeds by the island and we had to get out among the reeds to extricate the boat without taking any heed of raisky he changed his trousers and sat down with his feet drawn up under him in the great armchair so that his knees were on a level with his face and he supported his bearded chin upon them raisky observed him silently mark was twenty-seven built as if his muscles were iron and well proportioned a thick mane of light brown hair framed his pale face with its high arched forehead and fell in long locks on his neck the full beard was paler in colour his open bold irregular rather thin face was illuminated every now and then by a smile of which it was hard to read the meaning one could not tell whether it spelt vexation, mockery, or pleasure. His grey eyes could be bold and commanding, but for the most part wore a cold expression of contempt. Tied up in a knot as he was, he now sat motionless with staring eyes, stirring neither hand nor foot. There was something restless and watchful in the motionless attitude, as in that of a dog apparently at rest but ready to spring suddenly his eyes gleamed and he turned to raisky you will have brought some good cigars from st petersburg he began without ceremony give me one raisky offered his cigar case and reminded leonti that he had not introduced them what need is there of introduction you came in by the same way and both know who the other is words of wisdom from the scholar ejaculated mark that same mark of whom i wrote to you don't you remember said leonti wait i will introduce myself cried mark springing from the easy chair he posed ceremoniously and bowed i have the honour to present myself mark volokov under police surveillance involuntary citizen of this town he puffed away at his cigar and again rolled himself up in a ball. "'What do you do with yourself here?' asked Raisky. "'I think, as you do, you love art, and perhaps an artist.' "'And are you an artist, painter and musician?' broke in Leonti. "'And now he is writing a novel.' "'Take care, brother, he may put you in too,' Raisky signed to him to be silent. "'Yes, I am an artist,' Mark went on but of a different kind your aunt will have acquainted you with my works she won't hear your name mentioned there you have it but it was only a matter of a hundred apples or so that i plucked from over the fence the apples are mine you may take as many as you like many thanks but why should i need your permission i am accustomed to do everything in this life without permission therefore i will take the apples without your permission they taste better i was curious to make your acquaintance i hear so many tales about you what do they say little that is good probably they tell you i am a thief a monster the terror of the neighbourhood that's about it but if this reputation precedes me why should you seek my acquaintance i have torn your books as no doubt our friend there has informed you there he is to the point cried leonti i am glad he began the subject himself he is a good sort at the bottom if one is ill he waits on one like a nurse runs to the chemist and takes any amount of trouble but the rascal wanders round and gives no one any peace don't chatter so interrupted mark for that matter said raisky everybody does not abuse you Tit Nikonich Vatutin, for instance, goes out of his way to speak well of you. Is it possible? The sugar marquis. I left him some souvenirs of my presence. More than once I have waked him in the night by opening his bedroom window. He is always fussing about his health, but in all the forty years since he came here, no one remembers him to have been ill. I shall never return the money he lent me what more provocation would he have and yet he praises me 
so that is your department of art said raisky gaily what kind of an artist are you it is your turn to tell me i love and adore beauty i love art draw and make music and just now i am trying to write a great work a novel yes yes i see you are an artist of the kind we all are all with us russians everybody is an artist they use the chisel paint strum write poetry as you and your like do others drive in the mornings to the courts or the government offices others sit before their stalls playing draughts and still others stick on their estates art is everywhere do you feel no desire to enter any of these categories i have tried but don't know how to what brought you here i don't know myself it is all the same to me where i go i had a letter summoning me here from my aunt and i came mark busied himself in his thoughts and took no further interest in raisky raisky on the other hand examined the extraordinary person before him attentively studied the expression of his face followed his movements and tried to grasp the outline of a strong character thank god he said to himself that i am not the only idle aimless person here in this man there is something similar he wanders about reconciles himself to his fate and does nothing i at least draw and try to write my novel while he does nothing is he the victim of secret discord like myself is he always struggling between two fires imagination straying upward to the ideal lures him on on the one hand man nature and life in all its manifestations on the other he is attracted by a cold destructive analysis which allows nothing to live and will forget nothing an analysis that leads to eternal discontent and blighting cold is that his secret he glanced at mark who was already drowsing good-bye leonti he said it's time i was going home what am i to do with him he can stay here all right think of the books it's leaving the goat loose in the vegetable garden i might wheel him in the armchair into that dark little room and lock him in thought leonti but if he woke he might pull the roof down mark helped him out of his dilemma by jumping to his feet i'm going with you he said to raisky it is time for you to go to bed philosopher he said to leonti don't sit up at nights you have already got a yellow patch on your face and your eyes are hollow he put out the light stuffed on his cap and leapt out of the window Raisky followed his example, and they went down the garden once more, climbed the fence, and came out in the street. Listen, said Mark, I am hungry, and Leonti has nothing to give me. Can you help me to storm an inn? As far as I am concerned. But the things can be managed without the application of force. It is late, and the inns are shut. No one will open willingly, especially when it is known that I am in the case consequently we must enter by storm we will call far and then they will open at once and we can get in and be hurled out into the street again there you are wrong it is possible that i might be refused entrance but once in i remain a siege a row at night ah, you are afraid of the police laughed mark you are thinking of what the governor would decide on in such a serious case what neil andreevich would say how the company would take it now good-bye i will go and store my entrance alone wait i have another more delightful plan said raisky my aunt cannot you say bear to hear your name only the other day she declared she would in no circumstances give you hospitality well what then come home with me to supper and stay the night with me that's not a bad plan let us go they walked in silence almost feeding their way through the darkness when they came to the fence of the malinovka estate 
which bounded the vegetable garden, Raisky proposed to climb it. It would be better, said Mark, to go by way of the orchard or from the precipice. Here we shall wake the house and must make a circuit in addition. I always go the other way. You come here into the garden? What to do? To get apples. You have my permission, so long as Tatiana Markham does not catch you. I shan't be caught so easily. Look, someone has just leaped over the fence like us. Hi! Hey, stop! Don't try to hide. Who's there? Halt! Raisky, come and help me. He ran forward a few paces and seized someone. Raisky hurried to the point from which voices were audible, remarking, What cat's eyes you have! The man who was held fast by Mark's strong arms twisted round to free himself, and in the end fell to the ground and made for the fence. Catch him! Hold fast! There is another sneaking round in the vegetable garden, cried Raisky. Raisky saw dimly a figure about to spring down from the fence and demanded who it was. Sir, let me go. Do not ruin me, whispered a woman's voice. Is it you, Marina? What are you doing here? gently sir don't call me by name savelli will hear and will beat me off with you no stop i have found you at the right moment can you bring some supper to my room anything sir only for god's sake don't betray me i won't betray you tell me what there is in the kitchen the whole supper is there as you did not come no one ate anything there is sturgeon in jelly turkey all on ice bring it and what about wine there is a bottle in the sideboard and the fruit liqueurs are in marfa vasilievna's room be careful not to wake her she sleeps soundly let me go now sir for my husband may hear us run but take care you don't run into him he dare not do anything if he does meet me now i shall tell him that you have given me orders meanwhile mark had dragged his men from hiding Savili Leech, the unknown murmured, don't strike me. I ought to know the voice, said Raisky. Ah, you are not Savili Leech, thank God. I, sir, I'm the gardener from over there. What are you doing here? I came on a real errand, sir. Our clock has stopped, and I came here to wait for the church clock to strike. Devil take you, cried Mark, and gave the man a push that sent him reeling. The man sprang over the ditch and vanished in the darkness. Raisky, meantime, returned to the main entrance. He tried to open the door, not wishing to knock for fear of awaking his aunt. Marina, he called in a low voice. Marina, open! The bolt was pushed back. Raisky pushed open the door with his foot. Before him stood, he recognized the voice, Savelli, who flung himself upon him and held him wait my little dove i will make my reckoning with you not with marina take your hands off savelli it is i who not the master exclaimed savelli loosening his prisoner you are so good as to call marina but after a pause have you not seen her i had already asked her to leave some supper for me and to open the door he said untruthfully by way of protecting the unfaithful wife she had already heard that i am here now let my guest pass shut the door and go to bed yes sir said savelli and went slowly to his quarters meeting marina on the way why aren't you in bed you demon she cried dashing past him you sneak around at night you might be twisting the manes of the horses like a goblin and put me to shame before the gentry marina sped past light-footed as a sylph skillfully balancing dishes and plates in her hands and vanished into the dark night savelli's answer was a threatening gesture with his whip mark was indeed hungry and as raisky showed no hesitation either the sturgeon soon disappeared and when marina came to clear away there was not much to take now we should like something sweet suggested raisky no sweets are left marina assured them but i could get some preserves of which vasilisa has the keys better still punch said mark have you any rum 
probably she said in answer to an inquiring glance from raisky the cook was given a bottle this morning for a pudding i will see marina returned with a bottle of rum a lemon and sugar and then left the room the bowl was soon in flames which lighted up the darkened room with their pale blue light mark stirred it with the spoon while the sugar held between two spoons dripped slowly into the bowl from time to time he tasted it how long have you been in our town asked raisky after a short silence about two years you must assuredly be bored i try to amuse myself he said pouring out a glass for himself and emptying it drink he said pushing a glass towards raisky raisky drank slowly not from inclination but out of politeness to his guest it must be essential for you to do something and yet you appear to do nothing and what do you do i told you i am an artist show me proof of your art at the moment i have nothing except a trifling thing and even that is not complete he rose from the divan and uncovered marfinka's portrait hm. it's like her and good declared mark he told himself that Raisky had talent. And it would be excellent, but the head is too large in proportion and the shoulders a trifle broad. He has a straight eye, thought Raisky. I like best lightly observed background and accessories from which the figure detaches itself, light, gay, and transparent. You have found the secret of Marfinka's figure. The tone suits her hair and her complexion. Raisky recognized that he had taste and comprehension, and wondered if he were really an artist in a disguise. Do you know Marfinka? he asked. Yes. And Vera? Vera, too. Where have you met my cousins? You do not come to the house. At church. At church? But they say you never look inside a church i don't exactly remember where i have seen them in the village in the field raisky concluded his guest was a drunkard as he drank down glass after glass of punch mark guessed his thoughts you think it extraordinary that i should drink i do it out of sheer boredom because i'm idle and have no occupation but don't be afraid that I shall set the house on fire or murder anybody. Today I am drinking more than usual because I am tired and cold. But I am not a drunkard. It depends on ourselves whether we are idle or not. When you climbed over Leontes' fence, I thought you were a sensible individual, but now I see that you belong to the same kind of preaching person as Neil Andreevich is it true that you fired on him asked raisky curiously what nonsense i fired a shot among the pigeons to empty the barrel of my gun as i was returning from hunting he came up and shouted that i should stop because it was sinful if he had been content with protesting i should merely have called him a fool and there it would have ended but he began to stamp and to threaten i will have you put in prison you ruffian and will have you locked up where not even the raven will bring you a bone i allowed him to run through the whole gamut of polite remarks and listened calmly and then i too came at him and he ducked lost his stick and galoshes finally squatted on the ground and whimpered for forgiveness I shot into the air, that's all. A pretty distraction, commented Raisky ironically. No distraction, said Mark seriously. There was more in it, a badly needed lesson for the old boy. And then what? Nothing. He lied to the governor, saying that I had aimed at him, but missed. If I had been a peaceful citizen of the town, I should have been thrust into jail without delay. But as I am an outlaw, the governor inquired into the matter and advised Neil Andreevich to say nothing, so that no inquiry should be instituted from St. Petersburg. 
they fear that like far when i spoke of idleness said raisky i did not mean to read a moral yet when i see what your mind your abilities and your education are what have you seen that i can climb a hedge shoot at a fool eat and drink heavily he asked as he drained his glass raisky watched him and wondered uneasily how it would all end we were speaking of the art you love so much said mark i have been snatched from art as if from my mother's breast sighed raisky but i shall return and shall reach my goal no you will not laughed mark why not don't you believe in firm intentions how should i do otherwise since they say the way to hell is paved with them no you will do little more than you have accomplished already that is very little we and many like us simply rot and die the only wonder is that you don't drink that is how our artists half men usually end their careers smiling he thrust a glass towards his host but emptied it himself raisky concluded that he was cold malicious and heartless but the last remark had disturbed him was he really only half a man had he not a firm determination to reach the goal he had set before himself he was only making fun of him you see that i don't drink away my talents he remarked yes that is an improvement a step forward you haven't succumbed to society to perfumes gloves and dancing drinking is a different thing it goes to one man's head another is susceptible to passion tell me do you easily take fire ah i have touched the spot he went on as raisky colored that belongs to the artistic temperament to which nothing is foreign nihil humanum etc one loves wine another women a third cards the artists have usurped all these things for themselves now kindly explain what i am what you are why an artist without doubt who on a first acquaintance will drink storm public houses shoot borrow money and not repaid bravo an admirable description to justify your last remark and prove its truth beyond doubt lend me a hundred roubles i will never pay them back unless you and i should have exchanged our respective situations in life you say that in jest not at all the market gardener with whom i live feeds me he has no money nor have i raisky shrugged his shoulders felt in his pockets produced his pocket-book and laid some notes on the table you have counted wrong said mark there are only eighty here i have no more money on me my aunt keeps my money and i will send you the balance to-morrow don't forget this is enough for the moment and now i want to sleep my bed is at your disposal and i will sleep on the divan you are my guest i should be worse than a tatar if i did that murmured mark already half asleep lie down on your bed anything will do for me in a few minutes he was sleeping the sleep of a tired satisfied and drunken man worn out with cold and weariness raisky went to the window raised the curtain and looked out into the dark starlit night now and then a flame hovered over the unemptied bowl flared up and lighted up the room for a moment there was a gentle tap on the door oh, who is there he asked ay borushka open quickly what are you doing there said the anxious voice of tatiana markovna raisky opened the door and saw his aunt before him like a white-clad ghost what is going on here i saw a light through the window and thought you were asleep what is burning in the bowl rum do you drink punch at night she whispered looking first at him then at the bowl in amazement i am a sinner grandmother sometimes i drink and who is lying there asleep 
she asked in new terror as she gazed on the sleeping mark gently grandmother don't wake him it is mark mark shall i send for the police what have you to do with him you have been drinking punch at night with mark what has come over you boris pavlovich i found him at leontes we were both hungry so i brought him here and we had supper why didn't you call me who served you and what did they bring you marina did everything a cold meal ah borushka you shame me we had plenty to eat plenty without a single hot dish without dessert i will send up some preserves no no if you want anything i can wake mark and ask him good heavens i am in my night jacket she whispered and drew back to the door how he sleeps all rolled up like a little dog i'm ashamed boris pavlovich as if we had no beds in the house but put out the flames no dessert raisky extinguished the blue flame and embraced the old lady she made the sign of the cross over him looked round the room once more and went out on tiptoe just as he was going to lie down again there was another tap on the door he opened it immediately marina entered bearing a jar of preserves then she brought a bed and two pillows the mistress sent them she said raisky laughed heartily and was almost moved to tears End of chapter 9